He said giving is, is part of God's character. If you're taking notes, mark down Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12, verses 41 and following. In that, in that story, Jesus is there at the temple. And there are people who are coming in and they're watching them as they put their money in the treasury. And there's a little old lady who walked in. And she put in two small coins. And she walked off. Jesus turned to his disciples. He said, she gave more today than anyone else. Because all of these men who have come in and who have trumpeted their arrival and their giving, he says, they gave out of their excess, but she gave out of her poverty. We saw last week in 2 Corinthians 8 that God doesn't measure what you give. God is looking at what you have left. And really, God already knows. When you give, it's not that you're trying to impress God. Because if you're trying to prove a point to God or to impress Him, I've got bad news. You can't impress Him. And He already knows what you're going to give. And so giving is not about trying to, to do something to God or to prove a point to Him. It is proving a point to yourself. These men walked in and, and they gave, but it was out of their excess. And they walked home quite as comfortable as when they had come because that giving was no sacrifice at all. That giving was no test of faith. That giving was no expression of their trust in God, and yet hers was. A feeble little woman who said, God, this is how much I trust you. Now again, God is, is not asking you to do things to put yourself in financial jeopardy. Your financial jeopardy may be a result of poor decisions that you've made that, that you need help getting out of. And those can be handled by Christian financial professionals who can help you. But God is saying you'll never get out of any of that until you first make me the priority. And Jesus lauded this woman because her character was becoming like the very character of God, that she was a giver. And God himself is attracted to weakness. Paul talked about that too as he wrote to the Corinthians. He says that, that when I am weak, he says, then I found that I'm strong. Because it is in my weakness that I must trust God more than ever. And rather than trusting our money or trusting how much we have or how much we want, we trust God. But not only does it shape your character, I think it brings you peace with God. Malachi chapter 3, verse 8. Malachi 3, 8. Malachi says, will a man rob God? And the people who heard Malachi said, well, how do we rob him? Who's robbing God? We're giving. He says, no, you're not. You're robbing him in your tithes and your offerings. He says, you'll give the government everything that they're due because you're more afraid of them than you are of God. He said, but you're robbing God because you're not giving him what he deserves, which means that you don't think he's worth much, which means you don't trust him. And if you don't trust him, God can't do very many things in your life. And so there is this peace, this growing relationship with God when you are willing to give because you know, God, this is how much I trust you. And I know that you'll do something with this and that you will, you will do things in my life. I don't give so that, that I can be blessed, but I know that when I give, I will be blessed because that's what you want me to be as a giver. I think it also gives us a, a deeper walk because we're able to rejoice in our sufferings. How many of you over the last four or five months, how many of you have thanked God that the gas prices have gone up? Anybody said, thank you, Lord, for $4 gasoline? But wouldn't it be great if we did? Paul said to his friends in Rome, chapter 5, verse 3. Romans, chapter 5, verse 3. He says, we rejoice in our sufferings. Because we know that in our sufferings, we are being made more like Christ. James, in chapter 1 of his letter, he says that we should consider it pure joy whenever we face trials of many kinds because the testing of our faith develops perseverance. So the next time you're putting gas in the car and it's rolling up over 40 or 50 or $60, or if you've got a Suburban, oh my. Or if you drive a diesel, oh my, my. Stop for a moment and say, God, thank you that my eternal destination has nothing to do with this gas price. Thank you that even if it costs every penny I've got in my wallet, I have the inheritance of a saint waiting for me in heaven. And God, thank you that because this, this gas is so expensive, because this diesel is so high, I've had to reprioritize my life. And things that I used to think were important, like eating out or renting a movie or, or having extended cable or, 
or whatever it might have been, those things aren't nearly as important because I've got to have gasoline or diesel in this vehicle. And God, thank you that it's actually pointing me more and more to the real priority in life, which has to be you. And God, in this suffering, let me be thankful because it reminds me of how big you are. Rejoice in your suffering. So that as, as we give, it, it shapes us into the character of God. It gives us peace with Him because we're not withholding anything that He is due and, and our character is becoming more like Him. It gives us a deeper walk, an ability to rejoice. But I want you to look to, in a very neglected Old Testament prophet, Haggai. Haggai chapter 1, if you've got your pew Bible, it's on page 1120. Page 1120. Because I think one of the things that happens, not only is our character become more like God's, not only does our walk become deeper as we give, not only do we have peace with Him because we're not withholding anything that He deserves, but I think Haggai shows us that we understand what real trust is. What is real versus what is temporary. Haggai chapter 1. We'll start in verse 7. Now Haggai was writing to God's people in, a, in the late 400, early 400s B.C. This is 400 years before Christ. They have come back from captivity. And they're starting over. And their lives are actually starting to have a little prosperity. But the temple, the place where they worship, it's in ruins. And they spend a great deal of time getting their houses in order. They're comfortable. And they've become complacent. And things just aren't working right. And they can't figure out why. Haggai says this. Haggai, chapter 1, verse 7. Thus says the Lord of hosts. Haggai says, I'm just the messenger. Don't hate me because of what I'm about to say. He said, this is from God himself. Thus says the Lord, go up to the mountains, bring wood, and rebuild the temple, that I may be pleased with it and be glorified, says the Lord. You look for much, but behold, it comes to little. When you bring it home, I blow it away. Why? declares the Lord of hosts, because of my house, which lies desolate, while each of you runs to his own house. Therefore, because of you, the sky has withheld its dew, and the earth has withheld its produce. And I call for a drought on the land, on the mountains, on the grain, on the new wine, on the oil, on what the ground produces, on men, on cattle, and on all the labor of your hands. And then Zerubbabel, he was kind of running the show. He was the leader. Then Joshua, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God. They repented. But look back in verse 6. Look what he says in verse 6. You have sown much, but you harvest little. You eat, but there's not enough to be satisfied. You drink, but there's not enough to become drunk. You put on clothing, but no one is warm enough. And he earns, he who earns, earns wages to put into a purse with holes. Kind of have a feel right now sometimes, I think. You make money and then it's gone. There's never enough month at the end of the money. And God says, for many of you, the reason that is happening is because my temple is in shambles. And God no longer dwells in a building made by men. He dwells in us, those of us who believe. And he says, if you don't make me a priority, if you don't let my, your life focus around me, then everything will seem to be a waste of time. You'll put money in your purse and it will seem to have a hole in it. You will plant and nothing will produce. And it's because my relationship with you is not right. And yet when we become givers, it's because God is, is shaping our lives. And we're truly trusting in Him. Instead of trying to hold on to everything, we say, God, this is what I have. It, it all belongs to you. And so please, show me how to use this correctly. Because I'm tired of it blowing away. I'm tired of investing and none of it coming back. I'm tired of putting it in, the, in the, the bag and then it being gone. God, it has to be all about you and none about me. 